This is Talking Drupal, a weekly chat about web design and development from a group of guys with one thing in common. We love Drupal. This is episode 267, Our Tools. Welcome to Talking Drupal. In episode 67, circa 2014, we talked about the tools we use. We figured at this point, it's probably time to revisit that topic. Joining me as usual, we have our hosts, Stephen Cross. Stephen, good afternoon, sir. What's going on with you? Sir, good afternoon, sir. So I didn't go back and listen to the episode 200 episodes ago. I'm curious if we're going to say all the same tools again. I guess, I no. guess we'll have to figure that out later, right? I, I, know, I know we're not, but okay. um, some, some of them will be the same, but I know for a fact, like IDEs and dev tools and things have changed. Oh, that's true. So. Yeah, things have changed a lot. In how many years was it? My my IDE Been back years, then was, six years was probably uh, IntelliJ Coda, Coda or something like that. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. So what's new with me this week? Um, There's some surprising news that I saw across Twitter yesterday that Microsoft that? released Edge for Linux. Oh really? So it's out and it works. It's, the, it's still the dev version. It's not the final release, but um, it's can out. Some, you can you can do a Google. I'll put a link in the show notes too. But if you just do a Google search, Microsoft Edge for Linux, they they put out a blog post and they have a short video by the dev, key developer there, a primary developer explaining why they did it. Um, and they basically their approach was, hey, most of the build tools that people are using today are using Linux. Are using uh sorry yeah using Linux. And they want to be able to let people use Edge in those build tools, you know, to so this probably is, do uh, screen this is, testing and that kind of stuff. This is super interesting, right? In the fact that, you know, the new Microsoft, as I like to call them, they're becoming more of like a development uh, development advocacy company and, and doing all of these things that really um, kind of break the mold of the traditional Microsoft. Scaring um, the hell out of Linux people because they're getting into the Linux space big time. Uh, over the past couple of years. I mean, aren't they late to the game? Like, I mean, Linux has kind of been growing in popularity and, you know, it's always been like, oh, you're either a Mac guy or you're a Windows guy. And now you're either a Mac guy, a Linux guy or a Windows guy. So uh, so, so one question. Equally available, I think, uh, uh, for Mac as well now too. Was it already available for Mac? I I couldn't couldn't tell you. Uh, So that's my big... That's my big question. Like, why why would you want to use Microsoft Edge? Uh, I could tell you um, why I would use it because cross browser testing. Yeah, I I I'm building sites that work for the federal government, and that is the browser of choice. But doesn't uh, Edge just use Chromium? So, like, wouldn't I, now? As usual, they have yeah. their own impl- implementation for certain things yeah. that. Ah doesn't quite work the same way. Right. They rolled their um, own. Got it. Yeah. So yeah, it's, I mean, it's great it, just to have it. So uh, check it out. Yeah. Um, simple to, if you're on Linux, I'm on Ubuntu. I just copied down, a downloaded a dev file and it was running. It did is quirky. I could see that it doesn't quite work well with my tiling window management, uh, but those are little things are going to figure out. But they were in the in the video they released in the blog post. They're encouraging people, hey, download it and let us know it's broken so we can fix it. <laughs> cool, which was really cool. So, Nick, what's going on with uh, you this week? Uh, you know, not not too much. It's been a pretty quiet week. Um, I mean, it, weather's been kind of crazy. It's been you know really cold one day, pretty warm the next. I mean, it was like I had to turn the heat on last uh, three or four days ago because it was like forty degrees, but then the next day it was 70. So my wife said it was cold in the house and I said, put on a sweatshirt. Yeah. I mean, it was, I mean, it was too cold for me. So I, it was like 60 in the house cause it was 40 the whole day and then 40 overnight. So I had a sweatshirt on and I was still cold. So, um, but I've been, uh, you know, working on some, uh, weatherization projects. So I've been air sealing, re air sealing my basement. It had been previously air sealed, before we moved in. So we were pretty happy with that. And we had some, uh, so was, bees so was get the in. dog. Yeah. Yeah. He'll be, he'll be happy about it, but, um, we had some bees get into the basement. And so I did a closer inspection and 
you know, if you're a homeowner, you'll know that a lot of times contractors do the bare minimum and what's visible. Um, so on closer inspection, I found out that most of the basement isn't actually air sealed. Um, so I've been taking, spending an hour or two each night over the last week or so kind of taking care of that. So, um, you know, it's been, it, it's one of those things where it's a really easy job, you know, just take some time and patience and it's really satisfying. It'll save you a ton of money on your heating. It, it's, you know, it's good. So kind of like boring project, I guess, but I, I, I really enjoy those kinds of things. They're, they're the kind of tasks you can do that you don't have to actually worry about breaking something and having to call somebody in to clean up your mess. So uh, really low, low pressure, low stress. Sorry, Nick, do you have a finished basement? N- semi-finished. Semi-finished, um, okay. Cool. Yeah, there's parts of it that are finished, but we still have access to the sill plate everywhere. So, yeah. you know, I'm not having to tear anything out to... So. Yeah, I remember when I first bought my house, I put uh, I did some insulation along the knee wall and um, around the around the uh, the header uh, headers. Um, yeah, and you know some of my some of my family members have even gone as as far as putting insulation underneath the flooring uh, in between the floor joists. Um, but I, I just haven't gone that that far yet. Um, so insulation insulation uh, is important because it gets cold up here in New England and uh, heat is expensive. What's yep. new with you, John? So I got a, a, <laughs> I got a little bit of a gripe. Um, anybody's, um, you know, I'm sure nobody's surprised by that. So my wife has a, I'm going to say cricket, although there's some controversy on how it's properly pronounced, but my wife has a a cricket um, crafting machine. And basically what this machine is uh, for anybody that doesn't know is it's like a printer that allows you to um, cut out vinyl and um, different materials for, you know, gluing them onto shirts or putting them. It's a maker. It's a maker machine. Yeah, exactly. It's a, it's yeah, exactly. So I bought her this machine uh, uh, probably two Christmases ago. So it's, it's just under two years old. What do you make with it? So, I mean, my, my wife's made all sorts of stuff. She's made water bottles for um, uh, uh, JJ's sports stuff. She's made t-shirts for birthday parties and stuff like that. It's about putting a logo onto something. No. So like, it's got like a cutting wheel and you put a sheet in. Yeah. So So like Joanna makes Christmas makes cards, birthday cards, things yep, like that. You can do cutting, you can do printing certain models, yeah. even, even cut thin pieces of wood. So you could do like yeah. some sort of like woodworking with it if you really needed to. Like it's like a CNC, um, but it usually does like final cardboard or like written words with like a pen tip. Yep. So bought this thing, um, like, like I said, just, just under two years ago now. And, um, Last night, last night or the night before, uh, my wife went to turn her machine on to to make something, and the power button just lit up red. That's it, just lit up red. Didn't boot up, didn't do anything. And you know, obviously, she's like, "Oh, there's something wrong with my cricket." So I, we go on online, look it up, and she's like, "I've heard about this. People say like this thing's dead, and you basically just got to get a new one. There's nothing you can do." So. I was like, oh, well, Cricket Sports closed right now, but call them and see what they say. So today she called Cricket Support and essentially the guy's like, oh, yeah, the, you got the red light. Okay, well, we're going to try to do a firmware update. And she's like, well, no, I can't connect to my machine at all. I can't do like, and he's like, oh, yeah, okay. And the power block is working. And she's like, yes. And he's like, okay, yeah, you're pretty much all done. And he's like, there's nothing we can do. And it just, you know, it blows my mind that like, in this day and age, like we're buying electronics and like we're getting, especially this, it's not like, it's not overly expensive, but it's not overly it's cheap. It's not a cheap, it's not a and, cheap device. And we're, and, and like to get two years out of it. And now I'm, I'm basically like, so I asked her, I'm like, so what do I do with this cricket? I have this like printer sized cricket thing. Like, do I just throw it in a landfill? Do I give it to somebody and see if they can fix it? Like, what's the, you know, why aren't we, you know, why aren't we building things that like we can fix not crazy easily, but like kind of easily. I don't know. I feel like they, they should be able to refurbish it or something. Yeah. You got, you got me worried about Joanna's now. I think I got hers either last Christmas or the Christmas so, before. 
And Pro tip, don't leave it plugged in, I guess. A lot of people were saying that their um, their crickets would overheat and um, get really, really hmm. hot. And this guy also even said- Even if it's not being used? Yeah, even if it's not being used. And huh. um, they also said that uh, um, plug, keeping it plugged in, if there was a power surge, it could affect the, the machine as well. So my wife's always unplugged hers when she wasn't using it. Um, so that wasn't necessarily an issue, but yeah, uh, it was interesting. So now I'm, I'm basically like, okay, well, we'll go out and get another one. Sure. But like, so they just, so just so I'm clear here, they break when you don't use them. <laughs> uh, I mean, well, I, I suspect that the motor actually probably burns out over you. I mean, cause it's, I mean, it's a, it's basically a CNC, but it's really small. And I'm sure they, they skimp on those, the motor parts, right. you know? And so yeah, I'm sure gotta, that's what you got to feel out. like if that's, that's a thing that's going to happen there, they should have some sort of program where you can send it in and they can rehab it. Right. I'm, I'm, I'm sure corporate America is going to get right on that, especially since you're yes. considering purchasing a new one right now and replacing it. I mean, they're going to, they're just going to sell you another yeah, one. Yeah, I mean, I guess yes. so. It just makes it's like me buying just, a, it's like buying another Apple product every four years, right? Yeah. Four years into the cycle. Yeah, well, sort of, but I can trade in my current Apple product sure. and they'll recycle it. Right. So I'm not just did putting check, it in. A, did you check eBay? You might be able to get rid of it there. Someone might fix them and resell them. Yeah. Uh, no, I didn't, but I will, I will definitely look into that because yeah, this um, is a pricey enough product that there's probably people doing that. I mean, yeah. and I would do some more Googling cause I, I got to imagine, I mean, it's a maker uh, device and makers fix things. So, well, so that's my, that's my, uh, that was, that was her thing. She's like, can't you just open this thing up and like, you know, put it back together. And I'm like, well, well I mean, I guess I could try, but I don't know that that's going to go very well. She's like, but you, you've built a computer before. Like you should be able to do that. And I'm like, okay, all right. It's just, I did, yeah. I did, the thing that I remember the most about the cricket when we got it is um, one of the things that comes with it, or maybe you have to buy it separately, but one of the things you need is it comes with these like grid sheets that are semi-sticky. They have like an adhesive on them. And so you stick whatever you're cutting onto it, especially fabrics. Because you you need the fabric to stay still when it's being cut. Yep. And we have a couple. We have a couple of those. Yeah, yeah. And you can rinse them off and clean them. But anyway, when Joanna was using it for the first time, I came downstairs to see how I was going. When I closed the door, it like put a little gust of wind, and it flipped hers face down onto the carpet before she had had a chance to use it. Just the like the sticky thing. She was she was like no. She had, we had to you're, clean it. I mean, you're like, you rinse like, it underwater, it's fine. But you're like, I was oh, like, look at all that carpet fuzz. That's awesome. <laughs> the whole thing was completely stuck with carpet fuzz. But so, like I said, you rinse it off and it, it's fine. Let's move into our uh, primary topic, which is talking about um, the tools that we use. Um, and, you know, first up on the, uh, the review block here is um, operating systems and hardware. Obviously, uh, if, you're, if you're a fan of the show and you've watched before, you know that we have varying opinions on this. Um, so this sec segment should be pretty, pretty interesting. Uh, but first and foremost, let's talk about uh, Nick and Steven's all-time favorite, Linux. I mean, yeah, if, so, you're, if you're also a patron, you could hear 20 minutes of this discussion <laughs> before the show as well. That's true. Yeah. There was a heated debate on uh, Linux versus <laughs> Mac uh, before the show. So, yeah, and and some of the pros and cons. So, so yeah, I mean, it's no secret. I've been using Linux pretty much the whole duration of the show. I think I, I made the switch officially like a month or two before we started recording. So. Um, I've been on Linux now seven and a half years. Um, it's hard to believe sometimes that the show has been going that long, but um, yeah, it's something I've never looked back on. You know, most sites run on some sort of Linux architecture at this point, and a lot of build tools are, are built in in Linux, so it makes so, sense to be on the, the the base. Here's a question: Are you both using the same version or distribution of Linux? Same distro. It sounds like right now you just said you were on Ubuntu. So yeah, I'm using Pop OS on okay. my machines, uh, both because I basically run two computers here, and I just came off of Arch on one of them that I've been running for about a year. So um, I'm using Pop OS. I wrote a blog post okay. about months ago about why someone who just wants to get into Linux, Pop OS is a great way to start. 
So check that out if you're thinking about it. And then Nick, what are you, are you said you're running uh, Ubuntu? Yeah, I'm on Ubuntu 1804. So it's time for me to update to 2004. So the way Linux works is it has an LTS every two years, I believe on the fourth month. And some, there's something to do with the 10th month as well. I think it's so like, um, 18, four, um, but I'm, I'm currently at 18, four. I usually wait six or eight months after the next LTS before I update. So it's, it's just about time for me to update to 2004. Um, and I think they're supported for four years or so technically I could wait another two years, but, um, it's, it's good to move, but things like 19, the in-between year, um, there's a lot less stability is, um, a little bit less supported. So it's good to, you know, I went from, I think 14 or 16 to 18 and I'm going to jump on 20 and then in 22. I've been using 2004 for maybe three, four months now. It seems to be fine. Yeah. The, and, the biggest re- reason I wait is Docker usually takes a month or two to, yeah. to port. And so I just wait for it to get stable. And and then, I mean, there are like a bunch of different dis- Linux distributions. We did a whole show on Linux. We're probably going to do a couple more shows on Linux. So, I mean, you can, you can find every, every different, and I'm, I'm labeling that right there, distributions, right? Not versions, yeah. right? Um, yeah. So, you can you can get a variety of different different things there. Um, let's move into the hardware portion, and you know, no big surprise. I'm on I'm on Mac OS, so there's not much to talk about there. Um, but let's move into the hardware portion of uh, of this piece here. And um, what are you guys using for hardware with your with your Linux operating system? Uh, so I've got um, I've got a there's a company called System Seventy Six, which is a American company who builds the equipment here as well. I think they're out of Colorado and they specialize in hardware that's made for Linux. So you can get laptops and desktops. Um, I think it's, it's a premium, I would call it a premium level product in terms of pricing. Um, So it's not the cheapest way to go for hardware, but you know, like for a machine that you're going to be doing work on and you rely on day to day, it's a great way to it's a great way to go. So I've got a Linux laptop, my desktop um, that I do like most of the show production on and things like that is something that I built myself. I think we've talked about it a few times on the show, problems I've had and my experience building a machine for the first time. I have a few blog posts on that too. Your experience on, building a machine, your experience dropping a machine. Yes. Yeah. It's been, it's been <laughs> a lot of fun, but it's running great now. Um, so it's brand new. It should be. So I think right I, there's, an, there's some interesting stuff happening if you're interested in Linux too, that a lot of the, a lot of some of the major hardware vendors are starting to release hardware with Linux on it. So Lenovo is the most recent one where they have a whole line of their professional level machines. I think for laptops, it's like the X models um, that you can, when you go to their website, you actually can choose. I'd like Windows or Fedora or Ubuntu, I think on it. And it comes to you all yep. shipped and running. So uh, it's a great way to, if you're like a ThinkPad person, um, ThinkPad is really fantastic hardware um, and you can get it with Linux and you get full support. You get it supported as if you had Windows on it. And I think the price difference is about $100. Yep. Uh, the minute that you want to upgrade to Windows for the same hardware, it's $100 for the home edition. Then if you want it, the Windows professional edition, it's another $50. So it's another $150. Um, so it's yep. kind of interesting that when you spec out the same hardware and start to add the Windows software onto it, then the price starts to go up. And then you need, uh, like, you're probably going to get Office, which is another, you know, X number of dollars. So it's yeah. interesting. Uh, yeah, that was always one of the issues with laptops. Like, you couldn't buy laptops that didn't have windows on them or mac on yeah. them mac os already on them so you're already paying that premium yeah um so yeah i mean i i also have system 76 um one of the reasons why i went with them though is because i wanted to make sure i had something that supported my um four monitor or five monitor setup if i because i was thinking about moving ahead and and one of the things that linux sometimes was a little finicky with was more than two monitors um so, you know, there actually wasn't, when I got it, there actually was an issue with it. Their support was fantastic. I had to change some config stuff. They helped me boot in, figure that out. And 
Um, there's been one or two minor things where I've contacted support and even though it's been two or three years, they still respond within a day and, and try to help me debug whatever, whatever it is. Um, like Steven said, they are premium. I think they charge 30 to 40% more, um, for the hardware, but, um, for the support they provide, I think that's reasonable. Um, question on that. So what happens if, um, do, do they, will they do, will they like, basically, will it, could you ship them the computer if there's like some, some big, like big problem with it, you couldn't fix yourself. Um, and, and, do repairs that way, kind of like a uh, uh, Genius Bar or, or Apple esque experience. I think it depends on what the issue is and how soon after you buy it. But so it, it needs to be covered by warranty, like any other hardware yeah, vendor you sure. get from. If you have a three year warranty, they work with you on you know shipping the hardware yeah. back and doing that kind of stuff. Yeah, it's like any other place. Okay, yeah, cool. and 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 I think they probably also like for most things they would. I mean, it's not a Mac, so you could just open up and swap out a RAM right. stick. So they probably would ship you the ship RAM you part as well, right? Right. Yeah, right. and that, so that's one of the big advantages of something like System Seventy Six is that they're built to be maintained and customized and upgraded by you. So yep. you can upgrade all of the even the laptops. You can upgrade the parts that are in them pretty easily. It's not uh, you're not like voting yeah. a warranty by opening it. They're expecting you to open it. Yeah. That's that's interesting, and I mean that's probably the biggest the biggest difference, right? It's it it's yeah. sounds more like uh, you know the old school kind of like Dell approach to things, where like you're buying the different components, and then they're kind of giving you a premium service level, where they're premium components and then premium um, support to go along with it. Um, and yeah, and I mean if you if go ahead. as you say, if you know the hardware too, if you can also just find the equivalent. So for example, one of their models, right. the Meerkat just uses an Intel NUC. And so when I was looking at having like a home server, quote unquote, um, I just built one and then compared it to their hardware and made to make sure that it was compatible. Um, and, you know, put it together and it installed Ubuntu on it myself and it's been running now for two years. Okay. Perfectly fine. I think we've, we've talked about Linux enough. Steve had one more thing he yeah, wanted to say. Yeah, I had one say. more thing I just want to mention. Anyone looking for hardware, and this isn't even a, a um, Linux thing specifically, but my daughter is um, getting a new laptop. So I was comparing. She has been using Mac since she was a young kid. She's considered maybe flipping over to Windows based on the work that she's doing. Um, so I was comparing prices out there. And you know, back to the Lenovo ThinkPad, I was like, shocked at the service contracts that they have there so like for 50 dollars, you get like two years i think it was a two-year on-site service contract for 50 bucks interesting which is pretty impressive wow. right and you could increase that to be like for a hundred or 150 dollars for two or three years you can get a 24-hour on-site repair huh wow it was really impressive. Um, it's got to be, you know, the size and the vastness of their support around the right. country, but it was really impressive. So hmm. take a look at those machines. Yeah. Interesting. So um, as far as my operating system, like, again, no surprises. I'm using a MacBook Pro from, uh, I don't know, 2016, maybe. Here, let, let me check. Um, confirmed, 2016. And uh, you know what? Uh Tip, if you're in the Mac camp and you want to know whether you should buy a new um, laptop or not, uh, Mac Rumors actually has a buyer's guide um, that I actually use. I look at to see when a good time to buy a new new laptop is or a new phone or a new iPad, that sort of thing. Um, and, you know, it's super helpful. So, for example, right now, uh, it is telling me that I shouldn't buy a MacBook Pro because their chances are... Uh, in November, they're going to announce new models and new versions and stuff. So um, I will they say. They already have a date. It's uh, two weeks. There you go. Oh, really? Look yeah, at that. Two weeks. The, the, uh, I saw it the other day. In the, the announcement. The announcement. Two yeah. weeks. Subsequently, my wife needs a new laptop. So I'm yeah. thinking about gifting her mine and going out and buying a new one. But we'll see. We'll see how that goes. Uh, all right, let's move on to um, more development related things. Um, and our next topic here is 
IDEs and text editors. So I don't think there's a ton of uh, a ton of variation here. Um, and I know Nick and I, I think, use the same the same uh, code editor here. So I'm gonna I'm gonna let Nick talk about his his code editor. Yeah. So this is definitely one of the things that's changed from last time. I mean, when I was when we had the show last time, I was definitely using IntelliJ, which is the Linux version of PHP Storm that everybody in the Drupal world was using forever. Um, but VS Code, I think, Stephen, you started using that maybe a year ago. And I started hearing, uh, and it became available for Linux. And so I checked it out. And I mean, there were two things that kind of pushed me over to using that. One was how much faster it was yeah. than actually three things that pushed me over. It was so much faster than IntelliJ. Like anything that came from them, JetBrains was supremely slow. Um, the second thing is IntelliJ used to have lifetime um, licenses. I purchased one and they changed to a monthly or a yearly license and they quote unquote honored the license, meaning I could always install the older version, but I stopped getting updates. So that meant any new features weren't really available and, and community support wasn't great for it. Um, and the last thing that really kind of sealed the deal for me, which isn't really super relevant to like day-to-day -day work is, um, like I said, I have, I have a server, um, a home server that I run a bunch of stuff on. And a lot of it runs Docker. I, I run Docker on it so I could run a bunch of things in that. And VS Code runs in Docker. Um, so I have a VS Code Docker instance running so that on my local network, I can connect and edit any server configuration or Docker configuration that I need to without having to worry about sync, syncing files back and forth. So I get a full featured IDE that just runs in the browser. Um, and you know, it's not something I'd probably recommend for um, you know, business use, but for like casual, like when you know, adding some feature to the uh, home automation system, you know, it's, it's perfect for that. And, and it's the same thing I use every day. So, uh, so it's nice and easy. I, I think it's that kind of leads to the next tool we have on the list here, which is Vim. And it's in our list of IDE. Like it could be used as an IDE. And I've started using Vim a lot in the last six months or so. I wanted to see if I could use it for development. So I, put in a bunch of plugins and I can actually debug files and everything in Vim. I think one of the, one of the advantages of getting comfortable in Vim and I do this in, um, I do this now in a VS code is I run in Vim mode because huh. it's way easier to move around in a document for editing when you have like an edit mode and then just a view mode. So you can use your keyboard to jump around the file and edit things really quick. If you learn how to do that in Vim, you can be way more productive when you're text editing. Yeah, and I mean, Vim, Vim is like the matrix. When you when you get it, you like people watching you have no idea what's going on, right. but you have complete control. <laughs> yeah, and there's a Vim like one of the great things about VS Code is there's tons of extensions to do all kinds of stuff, and one of them is a Vim one. So now I kind of you work in the Vim mode whether I'm in VS Code or Vim. And the okay. beauty of that workflow is like mm. Nick mentioned is when you're doing stuff on a server, if Vim isn't there, VI is probably there and you can install Vim really quickly. So like your workflow for editing files is the same everywhere now. It doesn't matter if you're in a GUI, yep. if you're in the command line, you're always just kind of using the same keystrokes. That adds yeah. up over time. I've, I've known people, I've known people that have just solely used Vim and, yeah. um, I, I, like Nick said, it is like watching somebody enter the matrix. Um, you know, I'm, I'm definitely, uh, back when I was doing more coding, uh, I was using uh, VS code and, uh, again, another Microsoft product, which is, um, which is interesting and it's awesome. Like, there's so many extensions, like you can find an extension for anything like, Oh, I need to do this. I need to do that extension, extension, extension. Um, so super cool. Uh, moving right along, let's talk about terminals. Um, looks like uh, we got a, a difference in all, um, no, no consensus on terminals here. So Stephen, what are you using for a terminal? Uh, so in the last like eight months, I switched over to using Alacrity, which is um, 
It's probably available for anything. They claim to be the fastest terminal on the planet, and it is fast. And I believe it uses your GPU too, if you have one. Um, so I switched over to that like eight months ago. Um, and super fast, love the features of it. Not um, ter- like in a terminal, isn't like super important to me. I could kind of work in any terminal. Um, so I've got a color file that I use and it's on all my machines and some shortcuts, but uh, Alacrity happens to be one that I'm using, but terminals aren't all that important for me. Interesting. Nick, what about you? Yeah. So I was going to say something similar. Like, I mean, terminal, I'll probably catch some flack for this, but terminals are not important to me whatsoever. I just kind of use whatever's there. Like I've never, I've never seen a feature in a terminal that really made me go, huh, maybe I should use that. Um, and I'm, I'm sure there's reasons why people use different terminals. Um, but it's just one of those things that I haven't spent like the mental energy to really dig into it too much, you know, partly because it's, it seems like one of those rabbit hole technologies. It's like, once you figure out that there's differences, you know, you really want to configure it for yourself. Now I will kind of do the opposite of what the show is. There's one terminal that I absolutely despise using and that I have to use for certain situations. And that is putty. I hate using putty. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, I think, yeah. Is that on a, like a windows machine? That's a windows. Yeah. That's a windows yeah. I have a, I have a client that I have to VPN into a windows machine to connect to the servers to do some work. And the only way to SSH into the servers from the windows machine is putty. It is painful. Um, and that's what I used to use when I was on windows. So I'm familiar with it, but, yeah, my my, um, my terminal preference is not putty. <laughs> so, okay, well that's fair. Um, I'm using iTerm, which is uh, I think it's probably Mac only, um, but uh, yeah, it's just uh, you know a terminal uh, program that's a little bit more um, a little bit more robust than they just run of the mill terminal um, allows for screen splitting and all that sort of stuff question here and we don't have this in the show notes but um as far as a shell goes are you guys using anything special um i know personally i'm using z shell but um is there anything that you guys are using um bash. yeah i usually use bash i mean I, I do edit the i forget what it's called the ps1 um variable so that it like gives me more information for example so like when I'm in a directory, it tells me what directory I'm in. It tells me which um, branch I'm on. It will tell me whether I'm ahead or behind the upstream. So like if I'm, if my local branch is ahead of upstream, it'll give me plus one, plus two. And if it's behind, it'll give it a negative number. Or if it's both, if it's ahead and behind, it will show both. Um, so that's useful sometimes. Um, but yeah, I, I don't. I've I've looked at fish. I think it's called before, but I've never actually made the full change. Um, that if I, if I was going to look at something, I'd probably look at that before I use change terminals. Um, to be honest, yeah, I got a uh, I got a I got Z shell set up with a specific theme that basically shows you, um, you know, forget specifically what branch you're in, and like it changes color and icon if it's you know if it's. Um, needs to be rebased and stuff like that. So, uh, Hmm. it's pretty useful. I was just curious. I was just curious if, uh, there was a, uh, variation there. Our next topic is, um, (laughs) it's kind of, kind of basic, but I never, never, I guess I never really thought about it, but, um, what browsers are you guys using? So, so I use links, which is a text only brought. No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) Um, links is a text only browser that doesn't even load images. I don't think, um, uh, I've, I, the reason why I added this is kind of two reasons. One, because I, I recently switched it this year. Like, so for a long time, I was on Chrome only. Um, but sometime this year, maybe late last year, Firefox got fast again. Um, and mm-hmm. Firefox is so much faster now than Chrome is that, you know, that's that's one thing. Um, Firefox and Mozilla also focus a lot on privacy. Yep. So I, I'm obviously a huge fan of that. And they have two extensions that I really just, I, I really, um, a couple of features and a couple of extensions I use all the time. So one extension that I really like is JSON formatter. I'm sure it exists for other browsers, but it like formats JSON when you're looking at a page that outputs JSON mm-hmm. in a way that is readable. Um, 
maybe two months ago, they came out with a an extension called Facebook Container. So um, as I've mentioned on the show, I don't have a Facebook account anymore. But that doesn't stop Facebook from tracking you. Um, so the Facebook Container will block any connections to Facebook properties on websites, um, which interestingly has really shown where Facebook really has its claws. Like for example, um, I cannot log into Lingotech if I have Facebook container turned on when I get redirected to their single sign on. No, it doesn't block me. It just produces an infinite redirect. Yeah. Um, and I suspect that their single sign on, you know, they're using some endpoint at Facebook to authenticate and it just doesn't work. So it's, so it, sh- it kind of shows where like that I would never expect Facebook to be there. Like, it's not like, you know, some, some sites you can sign in using Facebook, obviously those places will have it, but um, they just have a normal account. Um, well, I'm also, yeah, I'm also using Facebook uh, and have been, or yeah, well, I am using Facebook. <laughs> I'm also using Firefox uh, and have been for, for, uh, for years. I never actually really jumped onto the Chrome train. Um, I was always, I've always been a, a Firefox user. Um, and, you know, I will say on the extension front, I have actually, uh, I use a uh, uh, extension called tab group switching, which allows you to basically have different tab groups and switch between them. Um, oh my God, I, I need that. I don't, I don't like to, um, I don't like to have multiple windows and I don't like to have um, a ton of tabs open, which I know some people out there are like, well, how do you do anything? But, um, but basically what this does is it gives you a list of tab groups and you can switch between them um, at any given point in time. And it's great because I, I, I section up my tab groups into like work tab groups, NedCamp tab groups, talking Drupal tab groups. And then, you know, I can I pull up whichever one I'm, I'm working on at that time. Um, so sorry. Uh, no, I was just, I was going to just turn it over to you and ask what you're using for a browser. Yeah, I think so you're... same thing, Firefox. Yeah, okay. For a couple of years. Um, Nick, I have JSON formatting already, and I don't have a plugin. So an extension for maybe, it. Maybe like, it's built in now. Yeah, I'm wondering if it's built in now. Yeah, that's what I was wondering. I mean, it gives um, you the thing. It lets you switch between headers, raw, and formatted. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty, a pretty and yeah, and it gives you a tree or not a tree, and then uh, you can see the raw. Maybe HTML. I need to undo it. Yeah. The the newest feature that they added that I really really like is if you right click in Firefox now, you can take a screenshot from the con- contextual menu, huh, and know. it's really full featured. I mean, you can just drag and take a random screenshot you can take the whole page you can take visible it's like the same thing you always used to have an extension oh, for yeah um and just do- and then you can download it or i think share it but it's it's pretty slick um and it's nice to have one less extension because that's one of the things too you know when you load an extension you're giving a lot of that data to exactly. whoever produced that extension um so the less so i will say few extensions i will say there that is true, and Mac OS has screenshotting built in, but you just kind of blew my mind with the whole page screenshotting capability because that's always a um, kind of a pain when you're doing that yep. sort of thing. So I appreciate and that. I, I learned thing, something. One, one more thing before we move on. I wanted to uh, say, are you guys using a Firefox account to sync your information between multiple computers? No. No. Okay. Cuz I cuz I only have a couple of extensions and I don't bookmark things. Yeah. I just I, I just, just keep 500 tabs I just open. <laughs> turned that on for the first time maybe a month ago. And I like it cuz I have two main machines and then I always have these like laptops, these old ThinkPads that I'm working on every once in a while and it's nice to just get all of my stuff there when I, I, I used to do that so, but I, I stopped doing that yeah when i stopped using firefox last time that's actually interesting so on that point um you know i have my laptop which is my primary work machine and then i don't really care to share tabs to my desktop system but um because i'm on the uh iOS ecosystem, I'm able to share tabs through iOS uh, in Firefox to my iPad or my phone right. if, if need be. So yeah, I've never seen a need for that um, that particular um, utility, but- um, You use it, you just do it a different way. 
Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yep. All right. Moving right along here. Let's talk about local development. I mean, I think it's no big surprise that we are all using Lando um, for local development. Um, and, um, obviously we're using Docker with Lando, um, cause that's a requirement. Uh, so I don't really have much to say here other than, you know, Lando's great. Um, I love spinning up a site with Lando and, you know, the recipes make it super easy to spin up sites for Pantheon or Drupal eight versus Drupal nine or, you know, WordPress or any other recipe that they may have. Um, anything you guys would like to add on the local development front? Um, I'm, I think the only thing is I, I also use Docker directly for some things. Like for example, um, I needed to run some SSL tests for a client a while back and there's a tool I think called SSLIs, um, that you can run to do some SSL tests. And I, I don't like to install random programs that I'm just going to use once on my computer. So, um, so I, I got it running in a Docker container. Um, same thing for AWS, um, CLI. So I do a lot of AWS work and, you know, I didn't want to have to install that and all its dependencies. So I just have a Docker container. And so I just call the Docker container when I need to run AWS commands. Um, so, so I do a, a fair amount of direct Docker development work. Interesting. Can you hear my baby crying over here? Yeah, can we can hear, hear the cat. I, I can hear <laughs> something. Yeah. It's a cat. So she, it, she's like, it's five o'clock, man. And you're not feeding me. So I'm going to come in here and harass the heck out of you. <laughs> <laughs> so funny. Uh, these, so the only thing I would add about Docker is, um, yeah, I've, I use it for little things like that. Like sometimes I like to have Hat and some of those kinds of tools running outside of Drupal. You just so simple, just pull down the container, spin that thing up and you're up and running. Interesting. Yep. Yeah. I think the only time <laughs> this is, this is, going to be telling. So brace yourselves. But I think the only time that I, I use Docker like directly is when I like just need to go in and kill a container because something's just not working the way that it should. Um, otherwise, I don't know that. Yeah, I don't think I've ever used it directly, but it's interesting to hear those use cases. So you can, you can use it on pies and stuff now too. Raspberry Pi, you can fire up Docker containers and stuff on there. Anyway, interesting. You don't need to go down that rabbit hole. Let's go. I'm sure, I'm sure our buddy Jeff Gerling has a few thoughts on that. Um, going into issue tracking, right? So I think everybody here is a Jira user. Um, maybe maybe Nick's using something. It looks like maybe Nick's using something else. But um, I think Jira is probably pretty much industry standard industry standard right now for, uh, for issue tracking, right? I, I mean, yeah. I mean, there's always people using Asana. I, I have a client that uses Rike. You know, there's Trello, there's Basecamp. I mean, there's there's tons of, Ton of them. Yeah. Is Trello them, really but... an issue tracker, though? Or is it just more of a oh, yeah. collaboration it, tool? Can be. It's an issue tracker. Yeah, I mean, okay. it's swim lanes and tasks, and that's all you really need. I mean, it's not great for a massive project, but um, I have clients that use it exclusively. Isn't that a... Alassian product now? Yeah, it is. Yep. Yes. Right. Yeah, they get purchased. Yeah. Has been for a while. Yeah, Alassian right. okay. has purchased purchased a lot of these. Uh, yeah, yeah. Not, you know, Bitbucket. Yeah. They they got everything. Yep. Um, so moving into our next our next set of tools here, these are uh, more productivity tools and and tools that can kind of just help you help you be better at your day to day, right? So first and foremost, we're talking about screenshots and copy paste tools. So um, I use a tool called Flycut. Again, I know Mac only, but um, there are Linux uh, versions of it. Um, I think uh, QCopy is one that I, I tried recently. Ha ha, surprised you guys, right? Um, but the great thing about Flycut is that um, essentially you can copy and paste um, normally as you would um, if you hit uh, copy paste it basically keeps track of of your copy and paste history and allows you to kind of scroll through it to see what you've copied and pasted um, by using uh, you know like command shift v as opposed to just command v so um, pretty useful uh, you can configure it to um, keep uh, different lengths of history um, you can also i believe configure it to um, exclude 
some applications. So, you know, if you're worried about security risk, you can you can configure it to not do certain certain applications. Um, but otherwise, do you guys have uh, copy and paste tools that you're uh, you're fond of? Control C, Control V. Yeah, me too. That's the ones I use. There you go. I mean, th- there there control are Control C and Control V as well when I'm in a terminal. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, th- there are tools that will like store a bunch of different clipboards, which which I've been looking into. I, I've been thinking about looking into because there's, I don't know, the number of times I like copy something and then copy something else and go, oh, wait, I need that other thing again. Yeah. I mean, I'm going to make um, a note right now that I need to go find a good one in Linux because. I yeah, it's been, it's been on my. Times a day. Check out. Yeah, it's check been on out, my list forever. Check out QCopy. That's the one I think I downloaded. I looked, did some research, and that's the one that was like, it, "This is most like Flycut." And basically, okay. it just, it just, you know, it sets up a uh, sets up a list of the things you've copied and pasted, and allows you to reselect them and reuse them if you need to. Super hmm. useful. So, um, Nick also mentioned that he uses the Firefox built-in screenshotting tool. Um, yeah, I mean. Most of the time, I'm taking a screenshot of something in a web browser, so that yeah. that works. I mean, obviously, you can take a full desktop screenshot, but one of the problems for me is I have four monitors, so those are enormous. Yeah. <laughs> so I have to edit it 100 percent of the time. Um, Stephen, I've got a tool, what, got yeah, a tool that I've been using in Linux for a couple of years now since I started with Linux, and it's just super awesome. I love it so much. It's called Flameshot, and what's great about it is screenshots are useless in my mind without simple annotation tool built into it. So you can mm. quickly make a line, highlight something or stick an arrow on it. Um, I probably use this four or five times a day. So a uh, flame shot. If you're on Linux, I do not believe it's available outside of Linux. Interesting. So about 4% of you will get <laughs> use out of that tool. Well, to be to be, I mean, to be fair, you have a, a Command Shift four in uh, on your on your Mac. If you're using a Mac, I'll do uh, the same thing. Um, and Apple, I think, in the last update or the one before, it added annotation and whatnot to the to the yeah. um, copy and paste or the screenshotting tool. <laughs> Moving on to to do lists, um, you know, I think overall uh, for the next couple of categories, to do lists and note note taking, I'm in. Um, I mean, the, the, uh, again, big surprise, the, the Apple camp and just using the kind of native Apple tools. Um, you know, I'm using reminders on, uh, on my Mac quite a bit and, you know, simply because it syncs to, um, you know, my iPad, my phone, my laptop, all of my computers basically. And also because, uh, my family is, a. um, uh, iOS family. So I can also, um, add things to my wife's reminders list and so on and so forth. So, uh, nothing really, um, riveting there from, from my, my to-do list tool. Steven, what about you? So I've switched to do lists once a year for the last 20 years, always looking for the <laughs> perfect solution. I've gone as ninja as OmniFocus and, <coughs> getting things done, workflows. And for the past probably 10 months now, or maybe even a year, I like went non-digital and I'm the happiest I've been. So anyone on the camera now, you can see that this is my to-do list. I use note cards. Hmm. I love the tactile of it. Q copy. <laughs> yeah, I just saw Yeah, the first one is Q copy, right? So there's a thing that says Q copy. I'm going to look at that later. Um and like, here's a to-do list from our Ned camp. Like last night, John asked me to do something. So it's Ned camp. That's what I got to do. And I have a due date on it. And the, it seems like, don't you want everything digital? But what's nice about this is they're like right here. And like every morning I kind of pick them up. I thumb through all of them. I pick out the ones I know I'm going to do that day. And I put them aside and I throw them in the trash can when I'm done. And during the day, I keep adding note cards to the pile. And then at the, at, before I leave at night, I go through it. And then when I get up in the morning, I go through it. So the it's great thing, working really nice. The great thing about that is yeah. that you can leave it at work, right? Yes, you just leave it on your desk. desk and you're like, gotta you got to go. Bye. Yep. Problem for me, right? Reminders for me is yeah. super important. So like not only do I set 
to-do list items, but I also add times for uh, reminders on those things. So that way, for example, when I know I'm going to be sitting on the couch at nine o'clock and I need to do something for, for Ned camp, I'll get a reminder like, Hey, remember you got to do this thing. So um, unfortunately an index card is not necessarily going to do that for me, but uh I can understand. Just pay your son to come throw the index card at you at a certain yeah, time. No, no think hopefully could, at nine o'clock, he's part. long asleep. Yeah. It's about your mindset and your, you know, yeah. if you know that you might have things to do at night, you kind of rifle through your cards. I mean, right. I right. don't need someone to tell me that I, I might need to do things tonight. I think that's something I can remember on my own. And then I just go through the cards. I mean, it's yeah. been working great for me. Yeah. Um, I know that I can. But I'm not but, constantly typing and looking at my phone for stuff all the time now either. Right. Yeah, I just I just don't do stuff at night. Yeah. Yeah. There you anymore. Go. That, that's. But I'm I'm gonna have to oh, think about you, the index card go. thing because because I, I definitely need because you're pretty system. much using an index card. It, it sounds like so. Nick's to do list item here is Notepad, which is yeah, like Notepad on the computer. No, no, like, I know, I, but I mean, just just go to an index. Yeah, card. it's not much. Yeah, if I, I'm not I'm not a huge list guy right now for for the last little bit, like I used to be. Um, I, f I really feel that this is kind of inspiring me to kind of look back at it, but um, I usually only make a list when um, I have a set of specific tasks for something that I need to get through or I have a particularly busy day um, where I'm not like, cause I, I tend, I tend to try to group clients um, on a particular day. So I'm not context switching too much, but if I have a day where I need to get like 10 things done for five different clients, then I'll make a list. And they're usually just very temporary. So I always just create a, um, a notepad uh, thing. The, the other place that I do list a lot is if I get blocked or something else is coming up and I just, I'm like, for example, I was recently doing a migration, writing a giant migration for a client. And um, I was like about halfway through and something came up that was urgent that I had to take care of for somebody else. So I just finished off the list. So I like, I wrote down like, this is where I stopped. This is everywhere I go. And then I saved it on my desktop as a, as a notepad, a TXT file. Um, so I could just pick up when I get back to it. Um, nope. But yeah, I'm not a huge list guy. I mean, I use email too for it, but. I will say that I, I understand the email thing. I do leave things in my inbox as a, as like a to-do list mechanism of like, Hey, got to go through this, got to do this thing. Um, also, I will say reminders in Slack, uh, especially when you're, you know, you're in those off hours and you're like, Oh, this thing came up like reminder, Remind me about that tomorrow morning in Slack is great. Is um, it a plugin? It's just a plugin you have? No, no, no. It comes it. it comes in Slack defaults no. by default, so built in. What, what do you do? Uh, well, uh, if you're on a mobile device, you hold the message and it pops up. And one of the options there is to set a reminder and it'll, oh, uh, it gives you, that. it gives you default options or you can set a custom reminder if you want to. Oh, okay. So our next so it's, is it's, so you don't you don't add a reminder to do something in Slack. It's a way to remind you about a Slack message. Sometimes I do. Yeah. It, it depends. Yeah, you just you add, just, you add you just a type a message to yourself, to yourself and then so you do uh, slash right remind. It, if you do slash remind and then me at time of this thing, it'll yeah. send you a reminder at that time. Uh, that's so much easier than just that's so much easier than just typing a message to yourself, right clicking and telling it to remind you. That kind of just blew my mind. Okay. Yep. Uh, well, yeah. Sometimes, so sometimes you get a Slack message, you can't answer it right away, and then you forget about it. I can see how that's super yep. handy because it's not now. It's not like unread anymore. Exactly. Yeah. It, once you read it, it got, you know the notification goes away. So that's usually when I'm like, "Up, oh, remind me about this tomorrow morning, or remind me about this in three hours or an hour or whatever." Mm. So um, I don't have any excuses anymore for those Slack messages that I never get back to. Yeah. Yeah. Slack has eliminated that. So moving into notes and note taking, um, you know, again, I'm just using, you know, Apple notes, uh, if I'm on, on device, I will say, I really do enjoy writing, getting, getting into that tactile thing. I really do enjoy writing notes. I feel like I, I can absorb them a little bit better. It also gives me a reason to go back and review them after the fact. And, um, I found this app. I don't know, Stephen, maybe you told me about it, but, um, paper for the iPad. And essentially what it is, is it's a, um, it's a notebook. It's a, you know, a moleskin notebook for your iPad. And you can, um, if you buy it, I think it's $12 a year or something like that. Um, 
you can get multiple notebooks. So you can have a notebook per, um, you know, per topic if you need to. Um, I even have, uh, you can add graphics to it. So I have like a Ned Camp notebook and an oomph notebook, but it's nice because I, I have the Apple pencil and I can, you know, get my iPad out and I can write down notes as I'm in, um, as I'm in a meeting. And then, um, you know, I can, uh, you know, take those notes and, and put them into whatever, uh, secondary method I need to later on. Uh, so for the same, for the same usage, I use something called good notes, iPad app works great. Love it. Super handy. Same. I mean, I'm, I I'm old school computer yeah. nerd, I guess in this case, I mean, I just use notepad, get it, which is, you know, Linux is notepad. Um, if I'm in a meeting and I'm having to take notes, I just throw them in there and then, um, it, it depends on, you know, what kind of meeting it's for. I'll either convert it into tickets, you know, something more structured or I'll hand it off to the PM to, <laughs> to generate. But, um, and then I usually just save them, you know, in, in a meeting folder so that I, I can find them again if I need to. But, um, yeah, I, I just type them out as I'm going. Cause I mean, I find like a lot of times the notes I take are like links or things like that. And I just don't want to have to write them out. And, and, and I don't want to have to have them in multiple places, like handwritten and, um, you know, stored somewhere else. So I just put them in a, in a text document. So before okay. I switched from Mac to Linux, I was using notes from Apple, which John is using. The beauty of that is that it's everywhere. Everywhere you have your Mac account, you have those notes. So they're super easy to get to. So I needed to find a solution to something like that when I switched to Linux and I use something called standard notes. And the nice thing about that, it's cloud syncing, but it's encrypted. So only I can ever get to it. They couldn't unencrypt it on their server at any point in time. And it works on all devices. So oh, cool. it's like an Apple notes, but it's OS agnostic. So it works on hmm. Android and I iOS and because I do, that's where I put like most of my tech notes, not like meeting notes, but more of like links. And if I'm working on a ticket and I'm taking notes about things I'm doing, all goes into standard notes. And I was able to convert my notes from Apple into this thing. So I've got thousands of them in there. I didn't need that, to look into that. That's interesting. So I, I got a little bit of a tip for folks out there and it sounds like maybe Steven could do this too, if he, if he needed to, but, um, uh, shopping list. Right. So like the, the, the weekly shopping list, like we were, we were for a while there struggling with like, Oh, how do we like, you know, Oh, go, go get this or go get that at the store. Don't forget to get this at the store and like Apple notes or, you know, any notes program gives you the ability to put like check, check boxes into, into your notes. So, um, I share, a, I share a note with my, with my wife and, and we're able to kind of create a shopping list and, um, you know, check things off as I'm at the supermarket, looking at my phone. I'm like, oh, okay, I need this check. I need that check. So, um, you know, note taking doesn't necessarily have to be work related. It can, it can be home related too. Um, moving on to, uh, some security items, uh, that everybody, uh, tends to use. Um, two factor authentication is obviously a very good idea for, um, for everybody. And there's a number of different tools that you can use out there. Um, what are you guys using for two-factor authentication and why? I'm using mostly Authy. Uh, why? I have no idea. It's one that I found years ago and it's been working fine for me. Um, I have for some customers, I have to use other ones. Like I think someone had Duo Mobile on here. I use that as well. Yep. Yep. Um, I've, I've yeah, used I mean, it, before. Google, and I have to use Google Authenticator for some sites too. So I use that as well. Yeah. I mean, Authy is my preference. It seems like it has the most, the most simple interface and the most widespread yeah. um, integration. But, you know, I have clients that I have to use Improvata for and Trust or Duo. I mean, right. really, it's if I have a choice, it's generally Authy. If I don't have yeah. a choice, it's whatever the client is requiring. Right. Same it's way. interesting. I, so, I do not use Authy. It's actually the first I've heard of it. I actually just use Google Authenticator. And now I'm interested as to what the major difference is between Google Authenticator and Authy. Any it's not ideas? owned by Google. Yeah, I don't know. Oh, okay. 
So if that's the only so is, thing, then. So it, support for it's not going to get dropped in three months? Random no, life, no uh, reason. No, come on. What do you mean? No, that's silly. Google. Google. They're not going to drop it, off. Nick, because it gives no, you the ability to spy at all your stuff. <laughs> I mean, yeah, Authenticator has no, no, been around forever, forever so I yeah, don't think yeah. I don't think that's going away. Yeah. Something um, being around forever doesn't doesn't save things at Google. I mean, just like the customers that require to use Google Authenticator. Nope. Oh, okay. None. I've, 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 some, I've actually, so I've used Duo, I've used Duo before, um, yeah. but yeah, Google Authenticator is usually my my go to. Um, so going, uh, you know, coming from two factor, let's go into password management. And I know I think we um, vary here a little bit. Uh, I'm using One Password, um, which I've used for for years. I actually um, have a, a got a got a free account with my with my router purchase. Um, so it's such a um, weird combination. Well, it, it's you sure it it's didn't not. come with the cricket. Uh, no, definitely, definitely didn't. So I, I actually recently got my, got my wife into one password cause there were some, uh, there were some shared passwords that we needed to share back and forth. And, you know, her password, uh, strategy was questionable, but, um, Steven, I know you're using a uh, Bitwarden. Hmm. I used one password when I was on, uh, well, I was an Apple guy. I used that for years. Works great. I think they're, I think they're multi-platform now. One password is. They are. Uh, then I, uh, when I switched to Linux, I moved to LastPass, and then since then I've gone to Bitwarden. So I've been on that. I maybe will. For a year or so. I will say, if you are a Linux user and you want to use One Password, it is not great. Um, you okay. know, they have a Mac app that um, obviously sits in your dock on your Mac, and you can kind of um, use a keyboard shortcut to open it up. On a Linux system, it ends up being a browser extension. So they push you towards the, right. um, yeah. I think on my machine, I'm using Firefox. So it, it pushes you towards the Firefox extension, right. which is great, except if you need passwords in your command line or something like that, then you would have to go through their like command line tool or something, something to that effect. So. <laughs> Just be aware that uh, the driving experience is not going to be the same. Uh, Nick, what are you using? I'm using Bitwarden as well. I mean, I, I do use their website for it, but one of the things that really drove me to it is you can host it yourself. And maybe someday I will. Um, That's exactly why I went to it as well. It was the option yeah. to move it if I wanted yeah. to. Yeah, you can, you can host it in Docker and everything. So um, yeah, I mean, what, one thing I'll say about password management that it took me a good, I've been using them for years and years now, but it took me a good couple of years to start doing this. But um, I've started just generating every single password. Um, and, and I still need to go back and kind of regenerate some of the older ones. And, you know, even the old ones that I had are pretty secure because I have a, a system, a good system. But, um, you know, it's better to just have generated ones that, you know, you don't have access to. Because as long as you have access to your email address and you can reset um, even if you lose access to Bitwarden or LastPass or something, you can still get back in. So, okay. Um, so our last topic here uh, is um, mobile apps, which is pretty pretty broad. Um, but uh, Stephen, you uh, have YouTube Premium listed here. I'm curious why. I have two listed here. So I, I think I've brought this up many times on the show before. I mean, I use YouTube for a ton of stuff, and for ten dollars a month to get rid of ads. And also when you're on your mobile phone, it allows you to minimize it and go do other things and listen. Oh, while you're on YouTube. And that's really what the premium, so the premium gives you those two key things. Which and how much, and how much I is it? to tons of stuff on YouTube, not just watch it. I listen to a lot of content. So to minimize it and just have it, my phone in my pocket is a beautiful thing. How much is it uh, a month? I think month? it's like ten bucks a month. Okay, you know, but ten you bucks get rid of the ads too. Ten, so. ten bucks a month, no ads, and being able to minimize YouTube and still listen to it is yeah. Uh, yeah. pretty good. Pretty good deal in my book. Um, and then your next thing is iOS fourteen. So uh, I've switched over the years between using a Android phone and an iOS device back and forth every couple of years. So I'm, I know them both very well. Love the flexibility of Android that you can customize stuff, move things around. Apple iOS was always you get what we give you until iOS 14 blew my mind is you can now create widgets and 
organize things way better than you could in the past. I feel like it's a huge improvement. Interesting. I did not see that going that way. So I'm in, I'm hmm. I'm impressed. I thought you were going to be like, I switched to Android and I uh, love it. No. Well, we're happy to we're happy to have you back on the iOS yeah. platform. I've, I've been iOS for a long time. I've last couple of years I've been on iOS. I just was blown away by this release for some reason. It seems like <laughs> far better than anything they've released in a long time. So uh, wrapping up here before we before we close out the show. Um, you know, there are, obviously we've been talking about kind of technical tools, right. That we're using and applications and services and whatnot. Um, but there are also, um, te technical, uh, content and enrichment, um, items out there, podcasts, blogs, events, that sort of thing that, um, you know, can, are helpful to, to people and help helpful to, uh, to us and doing our jobs. Uh, can you guys give me a uh, one or two of, uh, of those things that you, you know, you, you kind of gravitated towards over the years. Would you consider the political ones I listened to enriching? I'll probably leave those out. Yeah. Well, let's, let's steer clear of those. <laughs> and, and, um, for anybody else wondering the religious ones too, we'll just, we'll leave those, okay. leave those to the imagination. <laughs> Yeah. So I have to go way down my list then if you're going to put those, that kind of criteria around this. Um, uh, there's a podcast from a guy named Rich Roll. That's really good. Don't know if you've ever heard of him. He's a guy who uh, was a lawyer, got burned out, was an alcoholic, turned his life around. Um, now he's uh, really into health and fitness and he interviews a lot of people that are in that space of, you know, enriching your life things that are nutritional, exercise, um, just um, mindfulness and things like that. So I would just, I'll leave it with check out Rich Roll. Cool. What about you, Nick? Um, I, I actually don't listen to a whole lot of podcasts, um, to be honest, but I, th I think it's useful. Um, the two that I do listen to, I would really recommend that, that I do listen to regularly. I would really recommend. Um, and I think that they'll help you in different ways. I mean, one of them is, uh, and I've mentioned it a couple of times, is Drive to Work. Um, it's by Mark Rosewater, who's the lead designer of Magic the Gathering. So the main topic certainly is the game and the cards, but um, I actually get a lot of utility out of it from business because he talks about how to communicate, how to get requirements from people that don't necessarily know what they want. So, you know, one of the things that he says a lot is, you know, players want to enjoy the game. They're really good at identifying a problem. They're not good at identifying a solution. Now, they'll give you a solution. They'll say, I hate this. Here's what you need to do to fix it. Now, many times you can't do what, um, for whatever reason, you can't do what they're suggesting because it would break something else or doesn't have all the the, the criteria that they need. But um, you know, it gives you a way to think about design or relationships with clients that's really um, poignant. The other thing I listened to, and it was recommended to me by somebody at a past Ned camp, um, is the Adventure Zone. And it's a it's a family, uh, I think three brothers and a father just running like D&D &D campaigns. And um, the reason why I think that that's helpful is, you know, it's, it's important to give your mind to rest, you know, to have, um, you know, we spend a lot of time working and doing a lot of hard thinking for our clients. And sometimes it's important to, to take a break and take the time off and, and do something else that's enjoyable. And, you know, they, you know, again, if you don't enjoy games, you may not enjoy the, this podcast, but they're incredibly creative. They're pretty funny. Um, they're not experts. So it's not like the, you know, it, it, when you hear a D and D podcast is not what you would expect. Um, I think when they started, only one of them had ever played more than one game. Um, so it, it's pretty entertaining. Um, and if you enjoy those kinds of things, I could recommend it. That's cool. Uh, yeah. So I used to listen to a lot more podcasts when I had a, like a, a pretty substantial ride to work. Um, seeing as I, I don't, um, that 
time has dwindled um, a little bit, but uh, you know, my go-to is always this week in tech. You know, I find, you know, just the general tech news from that podcast, um, super, super interesting as far as keeping, keeping up on all the latest and greatest. Um, I've also been listening to the 10 seven podcast quite a bit. And uh, again, kind of more of a technical podcast, but um they are uh, basically interviewing people um, uh, and it's uh, more of an interview show. And I will say, I know I'm on a complete kick right now, but um, you know, if you haven't listened to our podcast with John O'Bacon, I actually went and signed up for his uh, newsletter and um, there have been two or three of them so far that I've just, I've, I've read the whole thing and they've been kind of super interesting. Um, he actually just put out a video on um conflict rev conflict resolution that you know i thought was super interesting and um you know the content is um there's no like um smoke and mirrors it's very much like hey here's a email about 10 things you should do when you're you know you're presenting and or here's a here's a video about conflict resolution and it's exactly that so that's uh that's pretty refreshing uh, as well well uh, this list has been, um, I won't say it's, it's been exhaustive, but uh, we've, we've covered a lot of ground here today. Uh, in closing, I'd like to remind everybody that the New England Drupal Camp's coming up uh, November 6th. Uh, this year, it is going to be a BOFCON. So no sessions. Everybody is um, jumping in to uh, lead BOFs. And uh, we have some great topics, uh, remote work, uh, CI pipelines. Steve's talking about Linux, um, if you're, you're interested in that. So, uh, yeah, I would uh, head over to nedcamp.org and sign up uh, for uh, the um, camp on November 6th. We're actually going to have a keynote um, by, uh, from the executive director of the Drupal Association, Heather Rocker. So pretty excited about that. Um, make sure you check out, uh, again, nedcamp.org for more information. And if you have any questions or feedback, you can reach us in many different ways. You can reach out to us on Twitter at Talking Drupal in the Talking Drupal channel on Drupal Slack, which has been gaining some traction recently. Uh, you can email us at show at talkingdrupal.com. And you can also get show updates by signing up for our newsletter at talkingdrupal.com slash newsletter. Thank you to our patrons out there who are supporting us. We really appreciate it. Uh, you can learn more about becoming a patron at talkingdrupal.com and choose the become a patron button. That's awesome. Uh, so Nick, if our listeners want to reach out to you and uh, bend your ear about Linux or any of the other tools that you use, how can they best go about doing that? Uh, you can find me pretty much everywhere at Nick's fan and I C X V A N. Steven, what about you? Hey, if you want to chat about Linux, sign up for Ned camp and visit the BOF, and we can chat about Linux. I don't want to be talking to myself for an hour. So uh, you can also reach me on Twitter, at Stephen Cross with a PH. And as usual, I'm John Picozzi. You can find me on most social networks, at John Picozzi, as well as Drupal.org. And then you can find out about Umfink at umfink.com. And if you've enjoyed listening, we've enjoyed talking. Hi, listeners. If you've gotten this far in the episode, congratulations. Uh, you may have noticed that at the top of the show, I said that this was episode 267 uh, and that in episode 67, we, uh, we, record, we talked about our tools. Well, come to find out this is actually episode 268 and uh, we debated changing the intro uh, and, you know, smoothing it over in post, if you will. Um, but we decided to, uh, to, Keep it in there because, uh, you know, everybody makes mistakes and it's okay to make mistakes. John is on probation. Uh, <laughs> do this. <laughs> the, show, the show notes said 267. Yes. But John should have known it was 268. <laughs> yes. Feel free to send your uh, complaints to John at John Picozzi. No. So, so, so my question is, and I wanted to ask this when we recorded, did you, were you, when you were coming up with the idea for the show, did you happen to look at, Hey, what was episode 67 since it was 200 episodes ago? Or did you come up with this idea? No. And then it just that, happened that to be, question. he's going to start doing that idea. now though. 
I had no idea it was 200 episodes later. He's going to go through the list. He's going to be like 200 shows ago. What did we no, do? 100 yeah, shows no. ago. What did we do? I mean, 50 shows I mean, ago. What did we do? It's It's been six years. So I think, it, I know, I think it's, it's pretty fair amazing. to repeat like, a I couple no of episodes. Idea. No, there was no clue that it was 200 episodes later. Uh, the real question is, have you had a chance to re listen to this show and then re-listen to that show to see what the differences were? I haven't, but I can tell you this. I've used two of the tools, John, that you recommended oh, in the, the show. Other one? So you said... Q copy, but it was actually copy Q for the buffer copy tool. <laughs> I, I clearly made two mistakes that day. Yeah, okay. So, so, nice. Okay, you made two <laughs> mistakes. But I used it. Uh, I've installed it, and I'm using it on all my machines now. It's awesome. And what's the really other tool? Awesome. And I also use the. Um, I've used the Slack reminder feature that I didn't know was there, and I used oh, it with the okay. message you sent me, by the way. Which was, hey, could you take a look at this for me? And I uh, set a reminder on it. Hey, actually, since we're <laughs> since we're going back to this show, yeah. did you see my uh, did you see my note in Slack about the uh, the cricket? No, I asked you if you wanted to uh, put that up on eBay and and <laughs> oh, I did. cut I it. Responded? Did you? Yeah, I did. <laughs> I responded. Oh, no, thank you. <laughs> oh, I didn't see the response either. I didn't see the response either. You didn't respond. Yes, I did. Yeah. No, you responded you with to-do list review done, <laughs> and, a, and a picture of your torn up note cards. Oh, no, I'm sorry. No, I, I thought I responded like five minutes after you sent it. Nope. No. Okay. All right. So shame on me. So, okay. So that's a, that's a hard pass. All right. Well, that's yeah, fair. Yeah. No, thank you. So yeah, as, as, uh, as John said, you know, we all make mistakes. John really isn't on double secret probation. Um, for this, but uh, yeah, if you if you noticed it, um, I'm sure we'll get some comments in the Drupal Slack. Uh, it's been getting a little bit more active recently. We appreciate that. Um, so you know, we'll I think we're gonna maybe look back 200 episodes. The next episode is gonna be scenarios. What happens if you're supporting a Drupal six website? Apparently, <laughs> <laughs> interesting. All right, thanks everybody. Have a good See one. Thanks, sweet. See ya. Bye.